All right. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to Journey to an FP Test Harness. I'm Mark Wax. I am better known as Justin Ducur in the uh, Scala community. Uh, fair warning, I'm about to take two months of self-education and try to compress it into 30 minutes. Uh, so this is going to go fairly quick. If I don't have time to take questions at the end, feel free to contact me. I can be reached as jducur on approximately every system on Earth. Uh, so once you figure out how to spell it, I'm easy to find. Um, so just as a little bit of background, I've been programming more or less forever. I've been programming Scala for about 10 years. I've been programming, I've been doing functional programming for a good 20 years. I'm very comfortable with, you know, higher order functions and functions as values and stuff like that. But I really hadn't ever touched the notion of pure functional programming until last year and until the, the situation that I'm about to talk about. Um, so this talk is about, is from one pure FP novice to other FP novices as an exercise in how I crossed the chasm of actually doing this stuff for the first time. Um, so just as a little bit of background about me, uh, for my day job, I work for Artima. We do Scala consulting, we do Scala training, and we publish some books you might have heard of. Uh, so thank you to Bill Venners for giving me the time during work hours to actually write this. Nights and weekends, I am the CEO and architect of a tiny company called Quirky. We are leading the small data revolution. And if you're curious about what in God's name that means, feel free to buttonhole me after the, after the talk or during the unconference or something like that, and I will be happy to burble about it. Um, Suffice it to say, Quirky is the context in which this all happened. Uh, it is entirely open source, and there is a link from the slides to the relevant code in the real running system. So let's talk about the problem that I was dealing with, which is testing. Quirky uh, originally has, has more or less forever, I mean for like six years, had a good suite of unit tests, you know, which test the sort of things that unit tests are good at. They take a little chunk of functionality and they check that that functionality does what it's supposed to do. And that's lovely, but in a big complex online system with many inputs and lots of users using it and stuff like that, unit tests aren't, don't really cut it very well. So Quirky also has some functional tests that I wrote a while ago. These are Selenium based, as these things usually are. They are driving the browser and actually running as simulated users and doing everything through the user interface. And this sucks. Um, you know, uh, being Selenium based, it is slow as mud. Um, it is sadly kind of non deterministic. And the code just, as a test, it's not a, a happy way of doing things because it's all about go and press this named button, wait for this item to change. It's, it's not a happy way of testing your back end. So what I realized a year or two ago that I really wanted was a set of API tests, something that sits just above play itself and drives the play APIs and, uh, and really honestly checks the server as the server to make sure that it's doing what it wants. So when thinking about what I wanted here, let me, let me do a brief digression about testing. I want to make a statement here that is apparently controversial, and that is that test code is code. Now, I, I hope that many of the rest of you have the same reaction that I do of, why is this controversial? You know, you would think, test code is code. This is a, this is a tautology, right? Except that in, out in the field, we often find that test code is enormously duplicative. You know, we've got 50 tests and all of them say do A, then B, then C, then D, then E. And the next one says do A, then B, then C prime, then D, then E, and so on and so forth over and over and over in duplication. They t are often non-deterministic. Non you know, how often have you hit the situation where you go and you run this test and it fails, and you say to the person next to you, oh my god, the test fails, and they say, oh, just run it again, it'll, it'll succeed. <laughs> Seriously, this happens all the time, and people are way too casual about it. That's not okay. 
Tests, the whole point of tests is that they should run reliably and test your system. They often don't follow best code practices. They often just kind of say, oh, well, it's just test code. And, and test code is often treated as this lesser thing than real code. But that's, that's insane because there is so much test code out there. Seriously, it is commonly the case you have three times as much test code as you have application code because every function, every, every functionality in your system needs to be tested 17 different ways. So you've got a huge amount of test code and so we bump up against the reality that factoring, good factoring always matters and that is especially the case in test code. You know, when you change a function in your system, you should not have to go rewrite 50 different tests in order, to, uh, in order to test that. The test code should be factored well enough to make adjustments straightforward. So when I was facing the question of I want to write a new test harness, I looked at it and everybody's been telling me for years that pure functional code is good for refactoring. So let's conduct an experiment. We're going to create a new API test harness using pure functional techniques. And the objective here is to wind up with clean, easy to read, easy to refactor code, despite the fact that I've never done this before. So I started out with some straightforward Scala test plus play code. Those of you who have done testing of play, this should be familiar looking. You know, we start out with a base trait that, that loads in our application. We write some tests that inherit from that trait. And this is, this is literally where I started because I decided that if I, you know, I, I knew to this pure functional stuff and if I try to write pure functional code from the outset, I'm just gonna be stuck with analysis paralysis. So let's start with something that actually works. So I wrote some very, very basic tests. And you know, and, and we've got some basic test functions here that this here is calling. You know, very easy stuff to get us started. And that's not terrible, but it very quickly hit the problems that I usually hit. That first of all, it starts to get cake-tastic. If you, if you uh, use this trait inherited way and you start trying to separate your concerns, you very quickly find yourself going, oh, well, I'll just add a self-type here for that dependency and I'll just add another self-type there and, and I'll just mix these things together and, and I mean, this is just the beginnings of it. Um, some of my functional tests got, you know, 10 levels of self-types deep and maintaining it was horrible. Um, you find Casual blocking. So those of you who have done Scala test plus play can look at this and, and will understand where this is blocking. Those of you who haven't, where is this blocking? Um, I mean, this is asynchronous code. It must be blocking somewhere. And I am sure that anyone who hasn't dealt with Scala test plus play is saying, oh, well, try login must be blocking and it's returning a result. No, the status check is blocking. It's just quietly doing this future. Well, we're going to, to do it await on it and, and wait for the results over and over and over and over again. This is not best coding practice. And yes, it works. But seriously, we should not be throwing away best coding practice casually. Um, you can quickly wind up with code that is tricky to comprehend. This is, this is one typical function out of my functional test harness. And it's just kind of, this is the way it grew. And, you know, I wrote this code and I have trouble figuring out all of what it does. And, and the result is that refactoring it is also kind of tricky. And, you know, we want to be refactoring well. Okay, so how do we take this and do it better? There turn out to be two key concepts that I found as I was trying to deconstruct this. And, uh, and they're pretty standard ones in functional programming. The first one is dealing with state. Um, in general, a test harness needs to understand state. And in particular, uh, a test harness of a web application usually needs two different kinds of state that it's keeping track of. On the one hand, it needs to be tracking what I call world state, which is the world of the server, all the information that the server knows that it has revealed to the test harness. 
there's a bunch of stuff you just need to know about of IDs and, and you know, just what, what you have built there and what the server has told you about it. On the other hand, there's client state, which is I am simulating a user of some sort. I am, I am simulating a thick client, I'm simulating a web browser, whatever. The server has passed back information that is specific to this client. I need both of these concepts of state in order to write a really robust test. I have to be managing a bunch of state. So how do we do state management in the functional world? The answer is the state monad. So we come to the word monad. Um, and for those of you who have been doing this for a long time, you're going, to, you're going quietly in the back of your head, oh god, it's the curse of Lady Monad Green. We are doomed. But, but let's take a stab at talking about monads. What is a monad? Um, the easiest way to think about a monad, in my opinion, is that it is a, a, a monad of type T is a box full of T-ness of some sort. This is easier to understand with examples. An option of T is a box that may or may not contain a T inside of it. A list of T is, is a box containing a sequence of T's of any length. A future of T is a box that eventually will probably contain a T inside of it. In general, it's, it's a box that has, that has something that's T-ish in it. So you would think, if you're just coming into this cold, that obviously a state monad is a box full of state, right? No, that is sadly not actually what it is. And this bit of confusion is what drives everyone crazy about the state monad. This is what, what took me two years to actually grok the state monad. What's actually going on here is that the state monad is a function that starts with an initial state and ends with a new state. So, for example, here is, here is a function that returns a state monad. Make thing is returning a data structure that contains a function that takes the, takes the current state and returns the new state and, oh yes, spits a value out the side. This is the actual, fun the actual signature of state. Uh, and by the way, this is all using cats terminology because I like cats. Cats is well documented. Use cats, it's great. Um, uh, so the state monad actually takes two parameters. One of them is the kind of state we are working with. And that's usually pretty consistent from step to step to step to step. The other one is for this particular step, what's the value I'm gonna return? And so we have a function that takes the starting state and returns the new state and the function that we're spitting out the side. And, you know, I find the easiest way to think about it is pronounce this word as state transformer. You know, it's easier to understand if you think of it as being called state transformer, but that's wordy, so it gets simply called state. Um, so the state monad is a box that contains this function in it. And therefore, the critical thing to remember is that when you write one of these, these functions, what you're getting back is a box that contains a function. Um, and the nice thing about it is that these compose nicely. You know, first we do a make thing. This takes the initial state, creates something, spits a value out the side, and returns the next state. And this one checks the value of that. And then this changes it, and then this checks the value of that. And we've got this nice, consistent progression that basically is that each of these state monads is a step of computation. That's the easiest way to think of it, is you're stepping through this, and each of these is basically one of your pieces of computation. And the neat thing about it is that it is separating out the state change of each step, if any, from the results that come out the side. And you can choose what you care about. Um, sometimes you care about the result, and so you take it out here. Sometimes you just want to change the state, and you don't care about the result, so you, that's what the underscore is for in all of your little four comprehensions. If underscore is pronounced eh. Um, um, sometimes you just want to check the state. This is basically an assertion. In a test harness, you're going to be doing a lot of these things that basically deep under the hood are just an assertion. 
Um, so that's basically the state side of things. Then there's the asynchronous side of things. Um, API tests are future-centric. It's one of the things that's very different from straightforward unit tests. Um, in an API test, everything is about, I'm going to hit the API and I'm going to get a future back. I'm going to hit the API and I'm going to get another future back. Everything's about these futures. But the thing about futures is that they're not entirely functional programming friendly because they are very eager. Um, the problem with futures is that you can't take a future and then say, okay, run the future now. No, as soon as you have a, have a future, it's running already. That makes it difficult to build things up. So futures and side effects are essentially here be dragons. You've got, you've got this dragon in your code. And this is where the I.O. monad comes in. The I.O. monad is a box that contains a dragon. That's the easiest way to think about it. Um, it may be easier to think about it as a cage that contains a dragon. You know, the dragons are everything that doesn't play nicely with functional programming, and the I.O. monad is the cage that you put it inside of. Um, it is specifically designed to hold futures. It's got a lot of functions that, are, that make it easy to take a future and stuff it into the cage. So let's put those pieces together. We have the state monad on the one hand. We have the I.O. monad on the other hand. We need both of them. How do we combine them together? We do that with state T. State T is basically the generalization of state, or, or really state is a special case of state T. Um, state T is state plus an effect, which in our case is going to be the I.O. monad. And by the way, where I say I.O. monad, there are lots of other things you can use as effects as well, but I.O. is very practical for this sort of thing. Um, so the actual signature that we're dealing with is like this. We have a state T, which is operating over an I.O. So we, we have a step of computation, which is going to possibly return a dragon, um, which is going to take a, a test state and return a new test state, and is going to spit something of type T out the side. Um, that's a little wordy, so I find that it is much easier to define that as test op, because that's really what this is. This complicated signature is saying this is what one test operation is. And the nice thing is that that applies to every level of granularity. At the very top level, your entire test is one test op that does everything. That is made up of a bunch of smaller test ops that do some stuff, each of which is made up of little test ops that do just one thing. But it's basically, it's nicely fractal all the way down. So um, in order to use this, it turns out that you need a bunch of little helper methods, which I wound up figuring out empirically. These are, these are some of the things I need. So I need you know, a function that just takes a value and stuffs it into a test op. I need a way to have a unit occasionally. Um, I need a way to take, just take the current state and do the following thing to the current state. I need a way to fetch a value out of the state. I need a way to take a future, you know, one of my dragons, and stuff it inside the cage and get a test op out of it. Um, eventually, I'll probably take some of this and put it into a little tiny library if folks are interested. So, okay, continuing to move along. How do you get from here to there? We started out, remember, with our straightforward, non-pure functional Scala test plus play function. What are some of the steps involved in getting to something that is cleaner? First of all, deal with the obvious side effects. If you're writing this in a traditional fashion, there is often going to be a temptation to stuff some of your state into your traits and just say, you know, I've got a var here in, in my, my trader. I'm, you know, I'm building a big map or something like that. These things are often identified by the fact that you're returning unit. In general, anytime you are returning unit from a function, that's a little suspicious. If you're returning unit, that means you're not, you're not returning anything. There are only two possibilities here. One is this function is not doing anything. Uh, if the function is not doing anything, take out the function. It's not useful. The other is it's, got, it's having some kind of side effect there. So these should always be red flags. In reality, they're not always going to be a problem because sometimes they're going to be, I am simply doing something to the server and I'm not getting anything back. That's a little weird. Usually you want to at least be getting a future back from your server. But, you know, whatever, you deal with the reality. But look for these, and in general, if it is 
saving some kind of state in your test harness, lift that out, actually have it return that as a value instead. Um, define an, an initial state type. This is more or less all the stuff that you lifted out of here. Anything that you had been sticking into your traits as values want to go into your state type. Start simple. Don't overcomplicate this initially. This is, this is what my initial state type looked like when I started the process. Step by step, build that up and discover what you want your, your world, what your world actually looks like. You know, this is what I came out with, where the first one is the harness info. Everything that my test needs to run. Things like the pointer to the play application. Um, the second line is the client state. This is the user that I currently am and everything I know about that user and everything that I have learned from the server about that user. The third one is the world state. Everything that I know about the server's own world and the, and the, the data that's in it that I'm gonna to need to work with. And the fourth one is a little bit of a cheat, but it's hugely useful and that is the cache of all of the clients. And this is so that, but this is because in a real world application, I often want to be testing multiple users at once. And I want to be able to bounce back and forth between multiple clients in a nice stepwise fashion. And by maintaining this cache of all of my client states, I can write one little function that says, okay, flip to user B, flip to user C, flip to user D, and step by step change which users are doing what. So this is one possible idea of how you might wind up building things. Um, clean up the play helpers. You, I, I showed you the status function before that was just casually blocking things. That's not ideal. I mean, you can do it, but if you're going to write principled code, write freaking principled code. Um, so I wound up taking the play result helpers and rewriting them in, in pure form instead. Uh, I recommend doing that. Leave all the futures in their cage. Um, again, this might get turned into a teeny little library at some point, although it's like only 10 or 15 lines long. Um, then wrap up your futures. Everywhere that your API is going out and fetching a future, make sure that you stuff it into its cage. And this, these first couple of lines are the, are the key in, uh, incantation. You are creating a state T which is wrapped around an IO which is coming from a, built from a future. And this is basically boilerplate and it's a little bit wordy, but it's basically what you're doing. Now the important thing about this is remember, the goal of doing this in functional style is you can refactor. Refactor, 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 refactor. So take all this messy stuff and wrap it up into something that's cleaner and easier to read. So the next step after, after this is to take that pattern and wrap it up into one simple thing that says this is the test operation of from the client make a call to the server invoking the user functions API calling the create space function. Uh, those of you who look at this and say this looks like an auto wire call you get a cookie. Um, basically just refactor until it looks clean. Just, just keep refactoring until you've got code that looks like you, like you want it to look. Um, as you get into this, you can now start rewriting your tests in this monadic style that you will see all over functional code, um, where each of these lines is a test op. And the result of this is that you wind up falling into this very regular style where every line is basically doing a test op and maybe getting a result out the side. Each of these steps may be doing a transformation of the, of the world state and the client state. It may not. And it may be taking a result out the side if you care about that. Um, it can also be doing straight up tests. You know, I mean, this is, this is simply a nice line of Scala test to check the results. That's fine. Um, but you wind up with basically this structure where this is building a data structure that describes the test. Note that this is just a val. This isn't running anything. This is just basically describing the test. And then down here at the bottom, we're saying, okay, and now run it. Again, it's a little bit of boilerplate. Now, once you've done all of this, you can take out the cake. Once your uh, traits 
don't contain any state in them anymore. You don't need to be building up this big cake. Everything is just pure functions. You know, you don't need to be inheriting it. So I find it's easiest to just pull everything out, import everything, and extend an object. And with this style, is isn't the only way you can do it, but it's very flexible. It means that you can either import these functions or mix in these functions, with whichever you prefer. Um, okay, one more trick, changing states. What I've been describing so far is every step of the operation is going from you receive this state and you stick, put out this state, but it's always the same type of state every time. It turns out in the real world that isn't always ideal because some of those states you know, are just empty at, at the beginning. I mean, at the beginning of the test, I know nothing about the world state. And the result is the world state kind of has to be this option instead. I can't, I can't just have a world state. I don't have a world state. So I wound, wound up with an option of world state, which is a little ugly. But it turns out that there's a way to fix this too. And that is this thing called indexed state T. This is the top level of the stack of all of this state stuff. What this is saying is that I have an effect IO, my dragon container, the state that I'm starting with at the beginning of my step, the state that I am winding up with at the end of my step, and the value I'm going to get out the side. And so we have a box here, which, oops, oops ah, sorry, um, which starts at the first state type and returns the next state type and the value we're sticking out the side. And inside of it, we've got a dragon or something like that. I think my metaphor is kind of falling apart at this point, but you get the idea. Um, and this allows us to, to model phase changes in the test. Um, this way, we can start our test in a pre-initialized state where all I've got is the harness info. I know nothing about the state of the world. And from that, I call this index state, state T thing, which does an operation which goes out and fetches the stuff I need in order to bootstrap me. And then from that, I can now, I now have a full state object that I can return out the side. So anytime your test makes a fundamental change in the way it's operating, you use this indexed state T thing. Finally, um, we had this boilerplate before. This is how I run a test. Anytime you have boilerplate, refactor. So we pull out this basic concept of run test, which takes a test op at any level. So this can, be, this can be a little piece of functionality. It can be a big piece of functionality. This is how you run it. You know, this, this just deals with the running stuff. And this allows me to basically mix things together however I like. So now here I've got a test op, this is the basic tests, the, sim the simplest smoke tests. And at the top level, I can have my smoke tests, which is all of the smoke tests merged together, and I can combine them all inside of a run test. But because this is all nicely refactorable, I can also have this over here, which is run just this one. So when my smoke tests die, I can say, huh, OK, let me just run that piece of it and see if that runs cleanly. So you can separate everything out cleanly, properly refactored, and be able to really drill into your tests however you need. OK, so did this all work? Yes, this was a really successful experiment. In the end, I wound up with a test harness that was easy to refactor, which is joyous. It means that the code, whenever the code is messy, I can make the code clean again, which is great. It's got this very consistent style where everything is about the notion of a step and operation of testing. And I can compose those together to make big, bigger pieces whenever I need to. Um, and I've got a lot of reusable infrastructure that I can just keep putting together, and anytime I see something that should be reused, I can just pull it out and reuse it as I feel like it. And that is pretty much that. Dragon tamed, and we have a test harness. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Um, can you please go back a couple slides back where you have this like uh, tests? Uh, uh, one more, uh, one more. Yeah, here. So like you have your bunch of different tests and then you stick them into this like mono, like full comprehension, mm -hmm. but they all like kind of return meh. What are, what are you say? <laughs> right. What? So what about like using uh, applicatives instead of monads here? Like. Uh, could certainly be done. I haven't explored that. Um, uh, when I mean, in general, I tend to think of applicatives as parallelism in you know in, in the system. I mean, you know, mon monads I tend to think of as as step 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 step. step. Sure, that's, that's um, what I'm saying. Like these steps, they look totally independent of each other, and you can they, they get are. benefits it, of uh, running tests in parallel, which is yeah, that that is certainly true. Uh, I hadn't even thought of that as the reality. I have a tendency to think in, in linear terms in terms of my tests, but yes, you're right that these could all be done as applicatives because they are basically independent of each other. Thank you, Justin, for the wonderful talk. I, um, we were wondering what inspired you to have the dragon and cage analogies? Um, purely, yeah, so, so pretty much this entire talk was, oh my god, my talk was accepted. What the heck do I write? There was a great deal of stream of consciousness put into this. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, I mean, I mean basically it boiled, it boiled down to the notion of the here be dragons. You know, the question was, how do I describe the I.O. monad? And really, as far as I can tell from my beginner's standpoint, the I.O. monad is whenever you, whenever you encounter stuff that, that isn't FP, you know, this is the box to stick it into, and, and hence the, the here be dragons. So I had a question. So when working on tests, the most satisfying thing is when you refactor your test and you catch a new bug because mm -hmm. the test got better. So did you catch any new bugs based on reworking on the tests and having better clarity, being able to remove duplication, this kind of thing. So in this particular case, no, that didn't happen, although really only, that's mostly because the, um, this, I mean, the process I'm describing here started when the tests were still extremely simple. Um, I, have I hit any new bugs that I found when refactoring? I don't think I did, although in theory that's not surprising. I mean, the whole goal of refactoring is that you are restructuring the code but not changing it functionally in any way. I mean, that's, that's what I think of as the ideal of, of refactoring. So in principle, you shouldn't find new bugs when you refactor, although I'm sure it probably happens. Uh, thank you, it's very interesting, uh, especially in the context of the Scala play uh, w where you were building this. Was there any transformation into this style that was particularly painful to make? No, I mean, there was a lot of self-education involved. I mean, you know, there, there were a bunch of places where I, I sort of came to this, oh. Um, and I mean, the, the play result helpers were one of the classic examples where I got to this and, and just had this, this, every one of these functions is blocking, and I just had this, dismaying realization of I'm going to have to rewrite this entire this entire sub library but in practice that wasn't too hard it mostly required going into the code and saying what the heck is this doing and and rewriting it in, in a straightforward functional style so I think your your next slide there speaks to something that I've run into myself yeah the system should basically work yep right <laughs> um, yep in in your process of refactoring um, I, one of the things I've always struggled with, particularly testing at, at kind of the functional API level for services is I wind up at that point. The mm -hmm. system should basically work. Did you find in your, in your refactoring that you were able to break down that statement into something smaller? Right, well, I mean, that's, that's kind of what this is doing is, is um, going from the, the full smoke test. I mean, the way I basically like to have uh, an end-to-end -end smoke test that hits all the functionality, at least in its standard incarnation. I mean, then there are the six million tests of edge cases. But I like to have a complete smoke test, on top of which I like, I, you know, there's the, the, one, the one test of, this is just the core stuff. This is, this is the stuff of, if, the, if this isn't working cleanly, nothing is going to work. Um, so it's just nice to be, the nice thing about being able to refactor like this is being able to think of it at this level. Um, 
uh, you know, being able to break everything down into smaller pieces means I can then rearrange those pieces to be what I need them to be. All right, thank you very much, Justin. Uh, we'll be resuming in 15 minutes, uh, 11.35.